This is Canoramic, and we're bringing you cannabis like you've never seen it before. Today, we are here with performer, professional hockey player, Riley Cote. He has played in the league. He's done amazing things in the league. And now he has embarked on a new venture, a new mission to bring wellness to the athletic community via cannabis. So we are so excited about to have you here today and for you to share the outstanding work that you're doing in the cannabis space. Welcome, Riley. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate the time. So you retired from the NHL um, and you started Athletes for Care. And this organization has just become wildly successful. I mean, you have everyone in your organization from, you know, Marvin Washington, Super Bowl champions, Mike Tyson, um, you know, you name it from every walk of, of athletics, from skateboarders to tennis players to rugby players, um, baseball. You've got all of these artists, and I'm sorry, not artists, because they are artists, but in, but in sports, all these athletes uh, under this banner. How was it that you created this organization? What was your mission when you came out of uh, professional sports to create this organization? Sure, it was a little bit of a process. I mean, I retired in 2010 at the age of 28 with a long, uh, laundry list of uh, physical injuries from, from the wear and tear of hockey. I was actually a fighter in hockey, fighting 30, 35 times a year. So that, you know, was extremely taxing on the physical body, but also, you know, the, the brain and, and the emotional state. So I, I made a decision to retire. And I kind of made the decision to, 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 to heal and find alternative healing methods and started with nutritional healing and, you know, started studying Ayurvedic medicine a little bit and, and Eastern medicine. And it seemed to always come back to the cannabis plant when you started doing, you know, your research and started studying this and uh, started off uh, transitioning from more animal proteins to plant-based proteins, got into uh, uh, hemp, plant-based proteins, hemp seed, nutritional profile of hemp seeds, extremely powerful. And that evolved into me really, really having a passion for the cannabis plant and identifying these non-intoxicating cannabinoids uh, outside of the THC world, which most people are, are understanding of. And then my education and advocacy efforts eventually kind of put me in circles of other athletes that had similar type stories, how cannabis impacted their lives in a positive fashion or helped save their lives in some cases, uh, which are extremely powerful. So the long and short of it is we kind of came together. It's power of numbers. And, and um, you know, throughout history, I think anytime you want social change, it's, it's, it's not you by yourself. It's, you know, it's a collective group of people that believe in the same mission. And in this case, it's just lands of being um, former athletes and actually current athletes as well. But uh, at the time, it was mainly uh, former. So we kind of band together, come and come up with this idea, say, listen, we're, we're, we're going to band together here. We're going to speak publicly. We're going to generate media. We're going to you know, be a resource for players. We're going to, you know, bang the drum um, and really bring some awareness around this. And it's, it's, it's been so organic how, it, how it's evolved from, I think we started off with maybe six athletes and I think we're up to 144. Um, I think there's only about 100 on our site right now. We're trying to keep up, but um, it's just evolved and, and it's been so much momentum behind it because it's, it's so real. Um, and you see the amount of lives it impacts um, in a positive fashion, not just in the sports world, but just in the general, in, just in the, in the general community, uh, and how cannabis acts as a, you know, as an anti-inflammatory and uh, helps with anxiety and sleep and just managing pain and, you know, really about harm reduction. So, the long and short, we come together in 2016, and we 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 have this idea of becoming official, calling it Athletes for Care, and really just pounding the pavement and, and bringing some awareness to this and help change, um, you know, sports, drug policies, but the, the bigger picture is engaging in, you know, research initiatives that not just impact the athletes, but um, the, the research impacts the general population and the general, you know, just the, the, the common man. Because this is what it's about. This is helping everyone. And again, it's this power of numbers. It's been amazing to see um, guys from all walks of life, different sports, completely different storylines, you know, come together um, to just, uh, you know, just to spread the good word and, and really put themselves out there because it's still, the prohibition still exists, the, st the stigma still exists. And, you know, there's, there's still a lot of backlash with it, depending on who you are and where you are. So um, props to all these guys for stepping out, putting their names out there and putting their face out there. Um, it's been nothing but positive, in, in my opinion. You know, there's always going to be haters, always going to be some friction. 
but we all know we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And uh, it's been an amazing ride for sure. Wow. I mean, this is amazing, the work that you guys have managed to do and how it's organically grown. I'm just curious, uh, you know, like you mentioned, there is, kind of, there is still the stigma and it's still illegal uh, federally here in the States as well as, you know, illegal in the leagues. You know, people have come out, you know, about cannabis. Um, you, you know, Mike James, for instance, you know, uh, you know, last year he took a hard stance on coming out of a cannabis closet and petitioning to use a medical waiver so he can use cannabis after he developed an opioid addiction. You know, are people, you know, is this difficult? Are this, is this still a whole nother layer of people who are just not present, not coming out, but are, are using and you guys are kind of at the front and there's like a whole underground of people who are actually still using it and supporting it? Absolutely, there's a whole nother layer, probably a few other layers actually. Um, you know, I think this uh, 2018 Farm Bill, when it passed, you know, the, the hemp side of things, so the non-intoxicating cannabinoids like CBD, you see as soon as that passed, all of a sudden a bunch of athletes started coming out of the woodworks. You know, it, it, it does take some jam to put yourself out there. You know what I mean? It's uncomfortable, um, you know, for some, because now all of a sudden it's, you, you, you publicly stated that you use cannabis, and there's just, again, there's still a lot of negative stigma around that. People look at that like, wow, you know, you, you're, you, you use you know, illicit drugs or, you know, it's like, you know, there's a lot of judgment still surrounding that. So um, slowly but surely, more and more guys are coming out of the woodworks and putting themselves out there, um, you know, and there's still a lot of conservative guys that are quietly doing it. You know, they're, they're at least using the medicine and, and, you know, finding a sustainable fashion to, to manage the daily grind and recovery process of sport. Um, but, you know, they're not ready to put themselves out there and that's okay. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's a place for everybody in this, um, but, um, you know, as this thing builds, you know, mainstream media has really kind of carried, uh, you know, a, a lot of weight with this for the, you know, the perception for the general population. And, um, you know, more and more of these stories come out and more guys come out, more people kind of connect the dots a little bit. But there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're, we really have any scratch the surface, in my opinion. There's some projects. I mean, we're living in the U.S. We're still still federally illegal. I mean, Canada is, I guess, somewhat progressive. There's a lot of you know, confusion up there. All the major sports leagues, cannabis is still a banned substance. CBD has kind of fallen in this gray area where people really aren't sure. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done still. So, um, in my opinion, really, really having to scratch the surface. Yes, we've done some great things. Uh, we're on the map, you can say that. But, um, you know, we're trying to get more guys out of the, you know, out of their comfort zone and put themselves out there. Because, again, you get one or two more big names, the maybe current guys, you know, whether it's, you know, a Tom Brady or a Tiger Woods or even a you know, retired legend like Wayne Gretzky. All of a sudden, they have such, they have such impact in the community and influence, not just nationally, but, you know, internationally and globally that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that has such, such, such power behind it. But, you know, it's everyone's doing their part. Everyone's, you know, got their brand or their little, their little niche project they're doing. Uh, outside of athletes for care but you know you bring these things together and uh it's, it's an amazing thing you know it really is an amazing thing and you know i think the sports world really does have a lot more um influence than than they give themselves credit for and i i, I say the same thing for myself from experience it's like i didn't realize how much influence we really had until you you put yourself out there and then you put yourself out there with a bunch of guys that are doing the same thing that believe in the same things and um, right the, the media can't help but pick it up because yeah. it's real. It's real. Yeah, between athletes and uh, artists, you know, you guys are the major influencers in American culture and in world culture. So the work that you do really will make a difference in turning the tide. I know, uh, just speaking of the media, uh, the Bleacher Report published an article citing several professional athletes who say they use cannabis while they were playing. They say they use cannabis for pain management, anxiety, insomnia, recreation, in lieu of pharmaceuticals, which could have adverse side effects like liver damage um, and addiction. So some estimated that 80 to 85 percent of players use cannabis. And we have science and anecdotal evidence about the medicinal can uh, qualities of cannabis with more research coming. Um, abstinence is obviously not that rule that the NHL and the NFL, all these leagues have, that's obviously failing, just like teams don't abstain from sex because you say, just don't do it or abstain from drugs. So, you know, why don't leagues simply take a look the other way approach? Can't they simply, you know, uh, not 
penalize players? Couldn't they just simply say, we're not going to penalize you? Um, because it's not required that they do it. It's really, it's federally um, illegal, but it's not required that leagues do it. And a lot of municipalities have a uh, approach similar where they don't penalize people. You might get a small fine, but you don't get um, a penalty. So why can't leagues do something like a look, have like a look the other way approach with so much pervasive use of, usage of cannabis? Sure. And they absolutely can do that. You know, it's a choice. You know, I think it's very, very political. There's liability involved in all this. Um, but if you look at the NHL, probably the most progressive sport when it comes to their cannabis policy, uh, while cannabis still is a bad substance in their, in their, in their drug policy, they don't enforce it. No one, no one goes to the substance abuse program for THC. No one gets suspended for four or five games like in the NFL for THC. It's kind of like what you said. They turn a blind eye. Um, in a perfect world, you, remo you remove it from the banned substance list altogether and actually promote it throughout not just the league, but the, you know, the, the organizations themselves through the medical staff and the strength and conditioning coaches as a recovery tool. So actually promoting this in a respectful, responsible manner. Um, but we got a long ways to go for there. But, uh, you know, you look at the archaic drug policies of the NFL. I mean, guys are you know, ruining their careers because they're trying to self-medicate with something sustainable. These guys are smarter than we give them credit for. Um, you know, the media likes to always paint this picture of all oh, this guy is just smoking weed and this guy is just doing drugs. Um, that's the media's perspective. But, 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 but the reality is this guy is just trying to heal. This guy just doesn't want to be a slave to opioids. This guy doesn't want to be a slave to alcohol and sleeping pills and muscle relaxers. That's why he's doing it. And that's why people have traditionally used cannabis forever is, is we, we all have pain. We all have suffering. We all have to manage our stressors and anxieties. And there's always been a sustainable way to do that. And, and then we introduce synthetic heroin into the, in, into the landscape and we ins insert all these different unsustainable, you know, tools to, you know, I wouldn't call them a tool even, uh, you know, sustainable toxic destruction to sleep and, you know, really, really impacting guys' uh, health. Um, so uh, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, NFL is probably the, the worst. Um, I think they're, you know, I'm talking to Marvin Washington, I think there is um, – uh, a bargaining chip here for the 2020 uh, collective bargaining agreement. Um, but these, 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 these sports organizations uh, and leagues have to make a change. Otherwise it's kind of cats out of the bag. Now, now you're liable. You're going to probably see some, you know, lawsuits thrown away if it doesn't change soon, because um, enough's enough. I mean, you know, the, the opioid crisis is very apparent and you see that through sport and you see that through the lens of sport. I see it in the hockey world, but I can't imagine um, how, how many guys are going through that in the football world because um, there's, there's triple the amount of players on each team and these guys are running heads head to head every play. Um, there's a lot more physical impact in, in hockey. And then you look at UFC, these guys are very progressive. These guys are all using CBD and cannabis and, and you know, they're, they're very in tune with their bodies. And I think the guys that are the most in tune with their bodies are the guys using cannabis and are addiction to pharmaceuticals. You know what I mean? But there's a lot of guys that still struggle mentally with, uh, you know, the moral issue. And it's not even a moral issue. It's more of a brainwashed issue right. because they're so programmed to, to think that, you know, cannabis is bad and, you know, pharmaceuticals is the way because that's the way what, what the medical establishment promotes. And we, we put a lot of faith into the medical establishment and the white coats. Um, and unfortunately, they've been misled just like the rest of us. Um, and, and they're passing on some you know, uh, pseudoscience along the way to the rest of us. And that, that's how we've become so confused and so toxic and, and have this real, this, this model of absolute destruction. And it's just killing people. So, um, you know, sports, the sports has got a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's, there's obviously a lot of focus on this topic. But, um, you know, until the U.S. federal government changes their stance, at least has a medical program, I don't see how the NFL or any of these major sports organizations can legally or you know without liability actually encourage their players to use cannabis or it's like you said earlier at the start of this this exact uh, topic was just turn a blind eye right. just don't test for it just say you're testing for it but don't enforce it whatever the case may be you got to help your players out a little bit better than they're doing right now mm -hmm. wow you have said so much i mean you know this issue is uh so pervasive, uh, not only it's reflected in the sports, but it's reflective in American society. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, 
uh, Jamie Brown, who is also an Athletes for Care ambassador. He tells his story of reaching the pinnacle of his career. He won a Super Bowl championship with the Denver Broncos. And he described how an injury premature, prematurely ended his career and how he developed an addiction to the opioids he had used when he was prescribed for pain and management of his pain. How much of an issue is addiction to opioids and other pharmaceuticals like sleeping pills in the pro athletic community? Oh, it's, it's, it's huge. It's huge. And you mix in, you know, the, the opioid, the sleeping pill and the kicker is the alcohol, right? I mean, it's like traditionally we self-medicate with alcohol, whether you think you're self-medicating or not, that's you're trying, you're, you're trying to achieve a feeling with that. And as we know, it dehydrates the body, dehydrates, dehydrates the brain and really promotes you know, negative behavior, you know, if you're not doing it responsibly, which most people don't really. I mean, once you get into two or three drinks. So, you know, stories like Jamie's are, are exactly why Athletes for Care exists is, is really the, is the transitioning, not so much even when you're playing. Yeah, that exists while you're playing. We'd love to stop that with, with cannabis, but transitioning out of a game into the real world with, with, with an injury. And, 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 with, and with a, a pill, pill bottle of opioids is like, is, is, is a recipe for destruction. And, and, and you see it over and over again. So these guys, um, you know, very, you know, I live in the sports world. It's, you know, it's very, um, you know, self-centered and egocentric, right? I mean, it's, you're worried about yourself and you, you know what I mean? You're living in this great little bubble and everyone loves what you're doing and everything's great. You're making money. And then all of a sudden, just like Jamie, this happens over and over again, uh, an injury you couldn't prevent that all of a sudden they tell you you can't play anymore. So now you're leaving the game with an injury from a game that you loved or in, in, in this like bubble that where they, they're essentially holding your hand and giving a schedule start of the season, where to be, what to wear, you know, what's for lunch, like all this stuff. And all of a sudden you're, you're in this real world um, and you have to cope and manage these things um, on your own. And again, they're not giving you cannabis uh, as you exit. They're giving you synthetic heroin as you exit. And it's, it's a real, real problem to, to not just manage the pain because now you're dealing with psychological stuff. You're dealing with purpose. You're dealing with who am I? And if you're, if you're, if you're on these types of drugs, when you're trying to discover who you are and identify you know, your true purpose post, post sport, um, it, it's, it, it's a downward spiral and a dark one and it goes to, and it happens real fast. You see guys that made a lot of money, you know, just just completely fall apart because again there's a there's a psychological issue there that paired up with you know with with real pain physical pain and you know concussions you want to mix in that conversation a lot of these especially in contact sport they're leading with concussion issues and they're getting you know they're confused they're getting 100 different opinions and then they're getting either given valium or whatever else to, to manage the concussion symptoms which is insane right the cannabis again you got neuroprotective properties the u.s government holds patents on this as, as cannabinoids as um as antioxidants and neuroprotectants so you got this you got this powerful herb here you know just on the other side of the uh, other side of the fence um but these guys have to, right now they have to figure this out on their own mm -hmm. because the medical establishment is not teaching it the teams are not promoting it and most people are just so confused and unsure on this whole thing. It's kind of one of these things that they're figuring out on their own. And unfortunately, when you figure something on, out on your own, some guys make it through successfully. But there's a lot of guys that don't because it takes time. Right. And if you develop an opioid dependency and addiction, <laughs> you know, that, 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 that can turn bad real fast where you, you're, not, you're not conscious enough anymore to see you know, cannabis as, you know, a true healing herb or a replacement for that. You know, you're not, you're not seeing so clearly anymore and it's, and it's hard. You're, you're a slave to the pharma now and you're a slave to these pills and it's tough. And so Jamie's story is ever present. Um, um, and, I, and I like to believe that these types of stories have, have minimized since players become more conscious, you know, age of information, ignorance is a choice. We all have smartphones that are, you know, at the tip of our hands here. Um, you know, even when I played back before, there was all these different delivery methods of cannabis. It was just dry herb. We'd smoke, you know, there were always a few guys on each team. We'd smoke together. Uh, but now there's so many different delivery systems and, and, and getting into the non-intoxicating cannabinoids. So there's, there's really kind of a cannabis product for everyone. And these guys, they're not, they're not living under a rock. These guys are smart, again, smarter than, they, than you give them credit for. And, um, and so... I like to think that most of these guys are self-medicating or finding alternatives. Unfortunately, it was the situation I ran into is once you start flying 
places and flying internationally, like that's where I kind of left my cannabis at home and kind of got gobbled up into the uh, you know, substance abuse with pharmaceutical drugs. I was trying to replace my cannabis with pharmaceuticals to try and do the same thing. So on the road, I was, you know, in pain, had some inflammation. So it was like a muscle relaxer and a painkiller and then, you know, a sleeping pill. So like three pills that I would be taking that was, that was essentially trying to accomplish the same thing that the cannabis did in a much more, you know, that was unsustainable versus the sustainable fashion with, with cannabis. So um, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's complicated, but um, it's, it's not that complicated, but it just takes belief. Right. Just, you know, that there's this it, spirit. It reminds, me, it reminds me a bit of, uh, of uh, veterans who come back from war. Exactly. It's exactly. You know, very, very similar. I've spoken to a number of veterans uh, in this conference and, you know, the symptoms of depression, isolation, um, confusion, not having a way to knowing how to operate in this, the real world. They've been kind of ensconced in this environment for a while where they've been told what time they get up. They've been told what time to, to be somewhere. And, and now because of an injury they're in, you know, or because they have psychological issues, they've been prescribed, you know, opioids of some issue uh, for PTSD, et cetera. And this is very, very parallel. Are you guys, do you, do you see the connection between this and, and veterans? Absolutely. And that's part of our messaging is that, you know, the veterans are essentially the epitome of what an athlete is. And, you know, these guys are going overseas and not getting paid for it, you know, living this glorious bubble. Like they're doing it for a completely different reason. But the bottom line is when they come back, um, what they're going through is, is very similar. And, you know, remove the money, remove the fame if there was any involved. Um, we're all human beings dealing with physical pain, um, PTSD. PTSD exists in sports. I mean, people think of they always relate it to just 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 veterans, but PTSD exists. Brain injury, traumatic brain injury. Um, so at, at the end of the day, it's kind of like you were once this athlete, or you once this 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 veteran fighting for something. You have this identity, and then now you're you're, you're like a wounded. You're you're, you're wounded, or you. You're, you're, you're done with that, but now you're in the real world. So it's coping. It's, it's coping, but not just like coping in society with just like finding a, a job and a, and a, and a way to, 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 to help sustain your family. But it's, it's how do I cope with all these injuries and, you know, this mental da you know, mental health issues that I'm dealing with and, and, and TBI and the whole bit. So it's, it, it, there's, there's an absolute parallel. We do a lot of stuff with veterans. The stories are so similar, wow. so similar. And, and, and it's kind of like, you know, the VA turns their back on cannabis as medicine. It's kind of like the sports organizations, the, the Players Association turns their back on cannabis as medicine. Wow. So you're forced to comply with whatever they give you. And so it's like, if you want, if you want the, the, the sports organization's uh, medical treatment, well, you're going to be using, you know, pharmaceuticals. And if you want the VAs, you're going to be doing the exact same thing. SSRIs, opioids, wh whatever it is. You know what I mean? Wow. So it's, it's very, very, very similar. Wow. You actually mentioned uh, the whole issue of traveling, uh, transporting yourself across, you know, different states and international uh, waters for the sports. And recently, NBA player D'Angelo Russell was cited uh, at an airport. He was cited by the police for carrying marijuana, um, though he only received a fine, you know, in New York, the statutes, uh, when you have, you're holding a minimum amount of marijuana, you know, for personal use, it's not prosecuted. Many athletes are risking physical danger, you know, having to go into CD locations and kind of do things undercover. They're, it, they're risking arrests and imprisonment for buying and are carrying marijuana across state lines, across international lines. Um, they're breaking federal law. You know, this is more than just a medical issue. It's a social social justice issue also, isn't it? Do you agree with that? 100%, yeah. It's, it's one of those things, there's, you know, in life, there's always, there's always a risk for the reward. And in this case, you have to, you have to risk your freedom um, and essentially running the risk of, you know, getting arrested and, and, and facing imprisonment or, you know, um, whatever the consequence would be, depending on exactly what you're charged with. But nonetheless, it's, it's taking away freedom. So you're, 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 tr you're, you're trying to heal and do the right thing. And, and, in, and in fact, you have to go break the law to just find relief and, and do what's right. And, you know, I say, I always say it's a good people break bad laws. And it's like, 
at, at the end of the day, it's like this is about survival in this world, and it's a different type of survival than it was two, three, four, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, where survival was more about finding food and you know what I mean, and, and, and navigating this. Now it's about finding the truth and, and discovering what's real, what's not real. So much misinformation, so much you know, you know, so much capitalism that's convoluted public health. Mm -hmm. So this is a social justice issue. That's absolutely. This is. This is, this to, to me, it's a, fu a fundamental human right to have cannabis. Mm -hmm. Just look at the cannabis plant in general. You want to get into the hemp side of things with the industrial applications. Like, you've taken away arguably the, the most useful resource known to man away from them. Mm -hmm. up, until, up until, you know, this, you know, this past year, we actually signed this farm bill back in the law. And you kind of say, okay, here's a, here's a crop back for you guys. It's like, well, thanks. Appreciate it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, thanks for looking out for us and our public health. So it's smoke and mirrors. It's, you know what I mean? It's, it, it, they pretend that they're looking out for a health and, um, and at the end of the day, they're not, um, unfortunately. I sound, like, I sound like a pessimist when I, when I talk like this because um, and I find myself sounding like that, but it's, but, it's, but it's the truth, unfortunately. You know what I mean? It, it is really dark. There's a lot of suffering that comes along with prohibition. And then you want to get into you know, incarcerating people in private prison systems and you want to talk about the racial angle on this whole thing. It's nothing, it's nothing more than a than than a control than than controlling resources by controlling people and um, you know and enslaving them in the private prison system complex. I mean, to me, it's like it's if you're evil, it's a perfectly orchestrated um, business model. Right. Uh, unfortunately, only the you know, the corner of the one percenters profit from this, and the rest of us suffer from it. And, you know what I mean? Have to go through this hardcore suffering before we even maybe identify cannabis as a tool. But most people go through their whole life in suffering and actually never find you know, the, the healing properties of cannabis, unfortunately, at mm -hmm. least in the last, you know, 60, you know, 60 years plus. Um, yeah, I look at my parents, for example, they're extremely conservative and they, you know, the, even, even today living in Canada with the, with the legal medical and rec program, they're still unsure. You know what I mean? They still, they still believe so much in the other model that, it's, it, it's, it's, it's frustrating. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to help people. And when you see, when you see, when you see people that just can't wrap their heads around, it's frustrating, but yeah, this is, this is, you know, this is people in running and risking, risking their lives for a long time with this. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of guys still doing it like that have been doing at this for 20, 25 years and, you know, advocating and, and getting themselves out to put themselves out there, running the risk, run, risking their families, you know, lives too. So, I mean, it should never be like that. We shouldn't have to have medical refugees or, you know, you look at it in Colorado where these children, these families are moving into Colorado to, you know, to treat their children's epilepsy. You know what I mean? Medical refugees. That sounds crazy. Like for an herb, for a plant. You know what I mean? So when you break down and, and you peel back the layers uh, and, you, and you just look at cannabis prohibition, pre-prohibition, how this, this resource has been such a useful one for us from, from a medicine standpoint all the way from a, for, for the, the industrial applications, it is a sin. I mean, it, 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 this will go down as the biggest crime against humanity. Wow. Uh, um, really. And we still have so much work to do. There's still people getting locked up, um, you know, ruining their lives, can't get jobs, you know what I mean? Coming out of prison, can't, you know, can, you, you can't re-emerge yourself back into society. Melissa Moore from the Drug Policy Alliance calls that the ripple effect. You know, yeah. uh, how, you know, how one incidence of you being, you know, picked up for a low level marijuana uh, charge essentially has a ripple effect, not only on you, but on your community, your family, um, your neighborhood. And that's what you're talking about. Um, I wanted to shift uh, a little bit to back to the medical side, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy, right? CTE. Yeah is a major issue in professional sports. What are the symptoms of CTE? Um, there seems to be some promising research on cannabis that suggests it may protect brain cells um, against injury, sort of like a helmet, but an internal helmet. Um, how do you see cannabis being used to prevent CTE in professional sports? Yeah, so I think the CTE conversation is, is, is somewhat complicated because, I mean, just, just in my opinion, this is my opinion, on CTE, I don't know if CTE is is just 100% uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, just concussions. I think there's other elements into CTE that are, are variables that we're really not discussing, and and the ones I identify with in, in my own personal life and I see in the sports world is is substance abuse along with brain injury, right? So they kind of come hand in hand. Where 
a lot of players in sports do drink more than they should. They do party harder than they should, dehydrating the brain. Um, you know, a lot of alcoholic uh, alcoholism in this in hockey world I can speak for, and I know that just runs parallel to society. Alcohol is, you know, the number one, you know, drug. Um, you know, you mix that into brain injury, it gets very complicated. Um, and and um, typically, um, you know, when you get a concussion, you know, you're sidelined. So you're sidelined and, you know, the, the protocols have changed a hundred times since, you know, since I played. It was like put a guy in a dark room, keep him away, all these different things. So naturally, when you're separated from your environment, naturally separated from your team and all this stuff, there's, 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 I don't know if it's, if it's depression from the actual concussion, if it's depression from the situation, I don't know. Um, mix, mix them both together. I mean, it, it lands up being one of the big ones, the depression and anxiety and, and you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, that whole deep, dark spiral. But I think, I, I think if you had struggles with substance abuse leading up to the TBI, it's just compounded. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of there's, there's people that have CTE that never played a contact sport. So it's like it's like where is the CTE really developing? If you want to like look at a brain that is qualified as CTE, and and you put it beside a brain with Alzheimer's or with and the next to a brain with that had a heavy alcoholism, they look very similar. Mm -hmm. So it's like I think a lot of these leagues defend this because they don't want to be liable for the you know the term CTE and saying okay we're gonna this guy had substance abuse for 12 years and he wants to blame all his brain issues and mental health issues on that one concussion. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it gets, it gets, it gets, it gets, gets complicated because as we know, brain health is, is more than just one dimensional, right? It's not just, I mean, I've had, I don't even know how many concussions. I've been over 250 hockey fights wow. and, and I, and I praise the cannabis plant and, and some of these non intoxicating cannabinoids and CBD oil for, for helping um, you know, balance my brain out and, and, and you know, again, the neuroprotective properties. But again, I also had some substance abuse, abuse uh, issues as well. So I'm being honest with my own personal story. When I hear these other people talk about CTE, just being 100% about the brain injury itself, I think, I think we're being naive in that conversation because um, I just know how much alcohol and, and pharmaceutical drugs are actually used in sport. Um, and, and I'm just honest with what those do to, to mental health. Right. Um, so, so coupling, so having cannabis as a resource, uh, you could feasibly not have to use the alcohol. Um, you would be able to have some protective benefits, uh, to your brain, according to research. Um, so feasibly cannabis could be a really strong tool for battling CTE in sports. Absolutely. As a preventative, proactive approach, as, as well as a reactive one. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of you know, research coming out of Israel as far as protecting your brain on the front end of competition. So, you know, getting these non-intoxicating cannabinoids in. So you're actually kind of protecting the brain. So if you have brain trauma occurs, you might minimize that concussion from a six-weeker to a two-weeker or a four-weeker to a maybe, maybe a day-to-dayer. Um, but, but then also once the, you know, the TBI happens, um, if it's, if it's serious or if it's mild, nonetheless, getting these cannabinoids in on the back end. So we're trying to, you know, it's, it's harm reduction, right? It's harm reduction as, as a medicine, but, but it's also harm reduction in the sense, well, we can get these, it's an exit drug. We can get these guys off alcohol. We get these guys off opioids that are very destructive to the brain, very destructive to mood. Um, and, and, and substitute that with a sustainable tool like cannabis. So all of a sudden you're not just... You're not just giving them a sustainable tool. You're actually protecting the brain in the meantime. So it's kind of like a, it's a double whammy. Right. Um, you know, I don't know how far we're away from that conversation ever be, you know, being realistic with, you know, actually, you know, promoting cannabinoids on the front end, not just so reactive. But that's kind of my angle too, is cannabis is a preventative, proactive medicine. We just talk about it in such a reactive fashion now because it seems to be so, so, so new to, to a lot of people. So, um, you know, that conversation is, is very... I say complicated because there's so many different medical opinions around it. But just from my own personal story and experience and seeing my environment and being honest with what, you know, brain injury is versus what, you know, substance abuse is and how both of those impact the brain and, and mood, um, you know, to combined, it, it gets messy. You know, right. it, it, gets, it gets really messy. So, uh, you know, we're trying to remove that cycle. Brain injury is, is inevitable in contact sport. You know, football, you, you sign up for it. Boxing, UFC, hockey, you sign up for it. You're running the risk of getting your bell rung. There's no question. But we shouldn't have to ruin our lives because we got our bell rung either. Right. So, you know, there, there, there's that buffer zone there where we, we need to be honest with that and say, okay, I 
acknowledge the, and run the risks of these things happening, but I have a sustainable tool to help prevent long-term damage and, you know, some of these dark stories that happen and, and, and really try and, you know, really, really focus on the harm reduction aspect of this. Similar to how you guys put helmets on before you apply, right? So it's, it's that preventative uh, approach as well. I know one of A4C's tenets is research and uh, I'd love for you to talk to us about some of the research you're engaging with or you're sponsoring or, or your players are involved in. I know that I heard something about uh, CBD and Canopy Growth, which is one of the largest medical marijuana organizations in the world. Can you share a little bit about the research that's being done with your organization? Sure, and that, that one's actually, when you mentioned right there, is actually the NHL Alumni Association partnered up with um, um, Canopy Growth, one of the largest cannabis companies, to, to study uh, exactly what I just talked about, you know, uh, concussion, TBI, brain health, um, specifically with CBD. Um, that's actually outside of Athletes for Care, where we're trying to, you know, help, you know, populate um, some people for this and bring it to, to light. But we have three other ones going on, and one is actually with a, a former NFL player. He played one year in the NFL. He's actually a medical doctor researching cannabinoids. Go figure. Um, it's Dr. Irve, not, uh, Dr. Irve Damas. And it's uh, based out of Florida, and it's this one just uh, for, for pain and inflammatory markers. So simple ones, you know, pain is one we, we seem to know of and understand a lot more. And then we're working on another one. Um, it's, um, it's actually through uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, as far as studying, uh, kind of mimicking the one in, um, in Canada, I was just studying brain health with these minor cannabinoids uh, and, and CBD. So um, we've got some interesting stuff going on. I think that's just gonna keep building, you know, the, the, more, the more the merrier, um, you know, more, you know we, we crave North American research. So we need to provide it, you know, and I think um, um, we're, we're doing that. There's other institutions obviously doing that. Um, but, you know, the more stuff we can get, you know, published and, and get to the general public just gives more people comfort. Because it's really, at the end of the day, this needs to come down, come through the medical establishment to really change enough lives, right? We, again, we put so much faith in the establishment, you know, it, it needs to come, it needs to come through them. So if we can help and, and, and enable them to, to you know, to engage in their own research because they see what we, what we have. Um, you know, that, that's a that's a win for us. But I mean, I, I can't I can't imagine the whole U.S. is going to be looking at athletes for care for their medical research. You know, I mean, that's that's where we're trying to influence the medical establishment for what, what we got. But um, ultimately, we're trying to um, just help them bring this to the general population because that's that's how you really make significant change with this. Right. Uh, I know that the NHL is, uh, didn't, wasn't there an announcement uh, recently that the NHL is considering using CBD or is that the same project with Canopy Growth? I, I'm, I believe that's the same. Okay, that's the same project. project. So, they, yeah, they never come out and said like, go use CBD. This okay, is so as of right now, none of the leagues have, an, have a positive uh, approach regarding cannabis or CBD, even though CBD is now federally legal. There's yeah, still, yeah. Well, so they certainly are not promoting it. I think there, there has been a statement, at least from the NHL standpoint, sent out to the players, basically, like buyer beware type of deal. Like not so much like um, don't take CBD, but just like be very careful what type of CBD you're taking because there's you know there's a lot of snake oil in the marketplace. There's a lot of people just white labeling, you know, garbage. Um, and, and, and the kicker is not just so much the CBD is the, what's in that bottle. Can, can you fail a drug test? The, one of your, the, the leads drug test for performance enhancing drugs in there. So that's the, they're, more, they're more so protecting their players. So they don't fail the performance enhancing drug test with something that be, might be in addition to in that product. That's why we have these NSF certifications. The right. leads really buy products that are NSF certified. So they know they can guarantee that this, this will never spark and fail a drug test for their players and there's liability involved. So they're just trying to remove liability, but you know, I would like to see them be more encouraging, to, you know, with the CBD thing. But again, I think it's just complicated for them. Right. Well, speaking of uh, products, uh, you've got a product line body check and um, I know that your focus is on, you know, the sports world. Um, would your product be something that would be, you know, certified? Is, is it something that you've kind of designed specifically for athletes, considering what you know of what athletes are dealing with? Uh, yeah, yes and no. So we're actually engaged in the NSF certification process. We don't want to corner ourselves in just like just pro sports or just the sports market. We're just in the, in the active lifestyle recovery market. So 
whether you know, just again, for, for the average Joe to the, the yoga mom to, to the athlete, I mean, I have enough experience with, you know, these products to know that um, we, we don't, we don't really have to make the special, special blend. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's going to be all these companies that are going to claim they have the special proprietary blend, all this stuff. Um, but I, I just learned that I'm just keeping it simple, keeping right. it simple for people to understand simple ingredients, simple, you know, understanding what it is, how it affects the body. But so whether you're a, uh, an elite athlete, you might just increase your dose, you know, versus the common man it doesn't inflict as much stress on their body. You just, you know, titrate back a little bit. Um, it, it, it's all relative, but at the end of the day, there's an athlete in all of us and it's all about recovery. So you manage your inflammation, you manage your pain, you manage your stressors and anxiety and you promote sleep. And mm -hmm. it, you know, whether you work a nine to five or you're an athlete, those are all, all relevant to the common man. Right. And, um, and, and you know, the kicker in the gravy is, is the neuroprotecting properties that, you know, that, that you're offered here um, for contact sports. So um, that's the lane we're staying in, you know, wellness and recovery. And we're not, you know, we're not touching disease state stuff. Um, but, you know, ditch the ibuprofen, the Tylenol, all these things. You know what I mean? This is kind of a substitute for that. So, again, whether you just like to go for your daily walk, work nine to five, or you're an elite athlete, our products can essentially cover all that turf. Right. Um, Right. Uh, I mean, this, this plant is not that complicated. Really. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the future, right? If you could create the future, what would be your ideal vision of the future of cannabis in professional sports? Well, in the future of professional sports is not just removing cannabis from the bad substance list, but actually promoting this through the organizations, through the leagues, the medical staff, and really teaching their players responsible cannabis use. Um, being honest with the conversation, alcohol versus say rec cannabis, and then this whole other world of you know sports recovery cannabinoids, probably in the locker room will be non-intoxicating, non-psychoactive cannabinoids like CBD. So there's like these two conversations, but I would like to think that in the future, guys are using cannabis instead of alcohol on their own. Um, and then guys in the locker room are using cannabis, whether it's hemp-derived CBD products uh, or whatnot, um, in replacement to opioids, sleeping pills, and muscle relaxers, tr you know, transdermal patches, you know, all these delivery systems that cannabis, uh, is the cannabis space is into. I, we, we can push all that stuff out and, and, and replace it with a sustainable tool like cannabis. So uh, I don't know when that will ever be, but, I, but, but if, if when that day happens, Outside of the locker room in the real world, people aren't going to prison for this. Every every street corner, you're going to be seeing you know cannabis. Um, now, now it's just an, at that point, it's basically identifying the good cannabis versus you know the industrialized biotech cannabis. You know, I mean, it's always going to be like support the local farmer thing with it and, and finding the best products. But um, you know, that's a different issue. Uh, what I'd like to see is just everyone has access to uh, access to it. No questions asked. No one's looking over their shoulder. And in fact, it's promoted. It's promoted through the hierarchy of the organization, through the medical staff, team doctors, and there's, there's the science is there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your perspective. Your work is so important, so vital, and so vibrant. And I know you say you've got a long way to go, but you have come so far. And we just encourage you to keep going for all of us who are cheering for you guys in the background, in the seats. Um, thank you for all you do. You have certainly given us uh, cannabis in a way we have never seen it before, Riley, and uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.